In today's talk, we welcome visual effects veteran Susan Thurmond O'Neill. She knows a thing or two about building dream teams. With tons of experience in commercials and feature films working for the likes of The Mill, Method Studios, and Digital Domain, she's a whiz at creating crews that click. As a recruiter for BLT Recruiting, Susan bridges the gap between exceptional VFX artists and cutting edge studios. A champion for the VFX community, Susan also holds some pretty impressive titles. First Vice Chair on the VES Executive Committee and Leader of the Membership Committee. Plus, she's a 2024 VES Global Board of Directors rock star. Well, thank you, Susan, for joining us today. Appreciate it. I'd love to kick off with a question about your background. So tell us a little bit more about you and uh, maybe starting with early childhood and what shaped you to be the person that you are today. Well, it's kind of a colorful story. Um, I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, my mom was a waitress and my dad was a used car salesman and a serial philanderer and a cheat and a gambler and a womanizer. And uh, as a result, we moved around a lot and there was always kind of some um, adventure around whether or not rent would get made. <laughs> we would take off with the last five bucks in the house and either turn it into rent at the ponies or come back empty handed with lots of colorful stories. And so as a result of that, one of the things I learned when I was really young is just adaptability, resilience, flexibility. We were constantly starting new schools, constantly learning new rules, constantly learning, learning, meeting new people and having to really put ourselves out there to be part of a group that maybe was really well established. So I know that's like a really kind of unusual, um, you know, inspiration, but having that instability um, allowed me the flexibility to be able to jump into any situation and figure out how to make it work. Um, flash forward to when I'm 13 and my mom married an amazing man who brought all kinds of stability and order to our household, which was incredible. I think for the first time, my, my little sister and I felt safe and we felt like, I mean, not that we were ever unsafe, but it was like, oh, this is what it means to be a kid. Oh, this is what it means to have a routine oh, this is what it means to have someone check in on you every night before you go to sleep and things like that. And as a result, um, I was given the confidence to get really involved in school and high school. Um, I did a lot of, um, I did, uh, was part of a mentor program to get kids who were maybe going to not graduate to graduate. Uh, I was part of the honors program. Um, I re was in class politics. I was in the drama club. I ran cross country. It was heaven. It was amazing. Uh, there was one teacher in particular who saw a spark in me and made me feel really smart and special and always signed me up for all of these extra correct extra curriculars. Like there was a Shakespeare class on a Saturday in some boho neighborhood in my hometown and mathematics and poetry and, and all of this stuff. It was pretty incredible. And then I put myself through college. I was the first person in my family to go to college and I was paying for it myself. My, my high school, one of our very distinguished alumni was Diane Sawyer. So yeah. when I was a kid, I idolized her. I was like, I'm going to be Diane Sawyer when I grow up, I'm going to be a hard hitting television journalist. So I enrolled myself in the communications program at the University of Louisville, which is all I could afford, the local school, and quickly learned that it was a repository for athletes for their plan B. Um, UofL is a huge football and basketball school mm -hmm. in Kentucky. And so it was, it was great being there, but I felt like it was remedial in a way. It wasn't challenging me. And since I was paying for it myself, I switched to medieval and ancient history. <laughs> <laughs> with a minor in French, which is where I like, I had this one professor. He was just your quintessential absent-minded professor, bedhead, unkempt beard, one brown shoe, one black shoe, you know, where are my glasses? You know, like that guy. <laughs> and he's the one who said, you don't need to know things. You just need to know how to find things. And he used to give the example of Einstein not memorizing his phone number because he could always look it up. So like, don't take your brain up with any extra stuff. Mm -hmm. It was more important to him to understand the sequence of events and how they affected one another rather than saying in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue or whatever. <laughs> so 
that was that was like a huge takeaway and it was pretty awesome and and then i moved to la chasing a boy <laughs> 1990 <laughs> and then you've been there ever since yep yep we spent three years breaking up um, I worked a couple of dead end jobs. Uh, one of them was as a royalties manager at Warner Brothers Records, where I was eventually fired because I was teaching everyone how to use Lotus One Two Three instead of doing my royalties report. Lotus One Two Three was like a non mouse driven command line driven form of Excel. Oh, okay. And so we had repeatable tasks, and it was driving me crazy that we had certain things that were constant with every royalties statement. And the only things that were variables was recoupment and numbers of units. And so I built a spreadsheet, no training or anything, you know, just kind of built a spreadsheet. So, cause we were using ledger paper and adding machine tape for everything to feed to the punch card computer across the street. I mean, it was like super antiquated um, technology, but um, my, my boss didn't believe in the power of computers and would double check my formulas with her adding machine tape. Mm. Um, and I was eventually given the sack because I didn't want to sit down and be accurate to the fifth decimal place on these things. I wanted to find a way to harness the technology to make things easier. I was helping people program their voicemail. And that was pretty devastating for me, actually. Like it was my first, I think you really kind of, you have to go through that. You have to go through like, hey, you didn't do what you were supposed to do. So you're out of here, you know, and the, but what it allowed me to do was figure out maybe a different kind of curiosity I had about a different way of working. However, my next job was the same at the Gordy company, which is um, like Motown's, um, uh, what do they call those? Mechanical royalties, like for this, not, not for the performance, but for the song writing, you know, if somebody mm, uses yep. your song. So that was miserable. And then my next door neighbor's like, Hey, I have this friend who works at this company called Digital Domain, and they're looking for an assistant to the chief financial officer. You should go for it. Like, what the heck is Digital Domain? And because there was no internet then, you just kind of had to, you know, borrow somebody's trades and, and figure out what was going on. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember it was a pretty arduous interview process. It was like three different meetings. I was living way the heck over in Echo Park near downtown LA. And they were in Venice. And I had a, a little stick shift car with AM only radio. And it was um, an adventure going on the freeway in that vehicle. Um, I'm a, the mother now of a 16 year old and I would never let my kid, no, no, that's not gonna happen. So mom, if you're listening to this, I apologize in advance for <laughs> being dangerous and reckless in my in my early 20s. Um, three interview process. And at the third interview, I knew this is, these are my people. This is what I want. And then when I got the job, I was, oh my gosh, I was overjoyed. I was like employee 20 something. Oh wow! And the parking lot at the time was taken up by this giant mountain that was being built for true lies. And then back on the stages, we had guys, uh, doing pyro we had models and miniatures being blown up um, over in the machine shop. They were machining the motion control rigs. And I was at the center of it all because uh, as this the assistant to the CFO, I got to see all the billing. And then our HR person, who was also our legal counsel, went on maternity leave. So I found myself helping to negotiate the contract for Apollo 13. Um, I found myself onboarding people. I found myself dealing with immigration lawyers to try and bring people into the country to work at digital domain. Um, I found myself working a little bit in production, getting to use an old timey chem to scroll through and look for elements for the opening of Mech Warrior 3. We ended up using the smoldering remains of Mount Vesuvius from Interview with a Vampire. Um, it was it was just like so, it, you have no idea. I was a kid in a candy shop. Yeah. I was spending probably 60 hours a week at work because it was just so freaking cool. So I was pretty lucky um, in that way, you know. And what were some of the biggest challenges you faced earlier on in your career? I entered visual effects at a time when people didn't go to school for this. 
So it was a little bit the wild, wild west. When we were recruiting to build the teams at Digital Domain, we basically grabbed anyone with a CS degree and brought them in because a lot of it was proprietary software. Whatever there was that was off the shelf was also being, you know, bashed about. We had Bill Spitzak and the team developing Nuke in-house. You didn't go to like a Nomon or a SCAD or something. You just kind of, you came ready to work. And I have to say as a recruiter now, the benefit of hiring somebody from another industry is that they come in with the soft skills that you Mm -hmm. need. It's not, it's vocational training. So you come in and you already know what to expect being part of a team and what it means to have a job and things like that. Whereas kids, I think sometimes coming out of school don't necessarily um, have that. But I think my challenges overall is like, I just wanted to somehow cram 36 hours into every day. Um, I was never really, I never really felt limited by anything when I was a digital domain. I felt fully supported. Everyone that I worked with trusted the other people to do what they said they were going to do. So I transitioned from being the assistant to the CFO into an operations position, Mm -hmm. which meant a little more money, which was great. And I was in charge of this big build out. So I got to learn a lot about pulling permits and 220 phase and 110 phase electricity and Cal OSHA requirements for the machine shop. And I mean, it was incredible. And I also got to talk to all the department heads and work with them on their annual budgets and reconciliations and depreciation of equipment, working with my boss to get the lease companies to provide us the money so we could get our upgrades. I mean, it was like learning how to run a studio. It was amazing. Um, And then the build out was finished. I was offered a cut in salary to work in production. And that first project was T23D, which was a theme park installation in association with Universal Studios. Jim Cameron shot it. Um, It was in three acts. The first act was live action backgrounds with a CG background. The second act was uh, some live action actors in the foreground. And then the background was really interesting 3D from the screen back, you know, versus the stuff that comes at you. It was kind of leveled like that. And it was all these mini hunter killers and people from T2 3D. And we had to add squib hits in stereo and blah, blah, blah. And then the third act was this massive three screen thing where this huge, enormous creature comes to life and reaches out and, you know, so where everyone's like, yeah. And, you know, when it spits, you get a little water on your face and your seat jumps when, you know, it was like that kind of thing. It was really fun. Amy Jupiter was my boss on that one. And she had a coordinator, um, who left to go work for a, um, celebrity, like as a personal assistant. So in the middle of the show, they had a vacancy. So the guy that I had reported to on the ops side is like, Hey, we want to offer you this position. We think you'd be really great in production because, um, you're really nosy and we think producers are really good when they're nosy. And it's like, I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah. I want to know a little bit about everything. So yeah, I'll take that around. Um, so I said, yes, I'll take it. Was lucky enough to work with Amy Jupiter, uh, one of my early mentors. And, um, I asked her later, like, how did you do it? You took someone who didn't know anything about production and you just sort of thrust me in it and let me run with it. You even let me make mistakes. How could you stand by and watch somebody screw up? And she said, oh, Susu, I just showed you the road and I gave you some guardrails. I was never going to let you go too far off course. And I always that like, that's like a really powerful metaphor. <laughs> From T23D, I was recruited by the team on Titanic um, to be a coordinator. And that was insane. Uh, that was easily 100 hour weeks. Um, oh, that's extreme. Brutal. And I was still driving, you know, an hour and a half each way and my poor cats, I would just sort of leave them alone and hope for the best. And, um, it was, it was nuts and it was, I don't know, 18 months. But the thing that was crazy about it is there was so much technology that was pioneered on that project. There was uh, CG water. We Mm. built half the ship in CD. In fact, my, uh, husband was rearranging virtual deck chairs Mm -hmm. on the Titanic while I was handing out camera lens info. And that's how we met friends for three years before we eventually married. And our daughter's middle name is Rose. (laughs) (laughs) Titanic has a lot of meaning to you guys. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was huge. And none of us really, when we were working on it, it was a, 
we didn't know, you know, we had no idea. So we're using motion capture for the first time to capture clothing, to capture stunts, uh, to capture walk cycles on these big impossible flyover mm. to the ship. Um, a lot of the people on the deck on those big flyover are me. Um, my walk <laughs> cycle, like I was one of the early persons that like they put me in Victorian clothing and little balls all over me to see if they could capture the clothes instead of having to solve that cloth yeah. on top of a human skeleton. Uh, we used um, a company called Viewpoint to scan everybody's faces so that we could do face replacement with the actors. And it does not really hold up very well now. You know, it's it, I think that Cameron is really interesting because his stories are very compelling. And then he always pushes the cutting edge with regard to technology. And it's kind of interesting to go back and see just like what we thought was Oh, look at all that water. It looks so photoreal. And I can't begin to tell you how much time we spent trying to solve cavitation. I mean, there was not like, it's at the time it was prisms, not Houdini mm. and robust, but it wasn't robust enough to figure out the physics of what happens when a propeller is spinning underwater. And the like, I can't begin to tell you how much time we spent on stuff like that mm. and, and wakes and clouds and were the stars correct for April 12th? whenever, you know, it was like, it was, it was, it was nuts. It was an incredible experience. Um, and I'm grateful I had it. Um, but then I was let go in the second round of layoffs in 1997. And, and that was devastating too. You know, um, you put a lot of your heart and soul into stuff. You're like, Hey, I'm employee number 20 something. And you're letting me go. You know, you just, it's, but all of that makes you who you are. And also it helps you set some boundaries and borders. This is work. You think it's your life and maybe yes. it's your passion, but really you do have to be professional and it is business and it's nothing personal. Um, unless you're not delivering, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Titanic, I remember it was a massive hit in the nineties. Like everybody was watching it at the cinema and had it on VHS tape and I know some people still talk about it today, so it must have been a wonderful experience to to be so closely involved in it, even if it was a hundred hour working weeks, which is pretty nauseating to think about. But I mean, as long as you had some bit of fun in there um, and the memories, you came away with some great memories. Then it was, it was kind of like a university experience, almost like an eighteen month, super intensive, super immersive. I got paid for it, which was great. Not very much, but who cares? I mean, I just, I was a living wage. Um, met some amazing people that I'm still close to today who are all off doing fabulous things. Um, and what would you say your biggest learning curve is to date? We all get comfortable in how we work. I think we all get a little, I, I'm used to using this tool and I'm used to using that tool. Mm -hmm. And I use LinkedIn a lot and they're constantly changing their interface, which frustrates the heck out of me. Um, because I used to be able to go here for something and now I have to go there for something. You know, it's like when your local supermarket keeps changing where they keep the peaches, you know, I just want my peaches. Just don't want to go to the same place. Uh, that I think. And then, um, I'm commission based. So I'm kind of at the mercy of my clients having a need. And the more I stay self-employed, the more I feel like an outsider sometimes mm -hmm. at the studios that I'm trying to help. Um, in the early days when I was closer to production, I got really good at being able to go into a studio and quickly look around and see where the imbalance and personalities might be, because it really does take a bunch of different kinds of personalities. I use the analogy of Laverne and Shirley. If you go into a studio where there's like 55 Laverne's, like where are the Shirley's? Is there a Carmine? Do you have a Lenny and a Squiggy? I mean, you have to have this team mm. and these kinds of personalities. Um, with COVID and with the downturn in business in general, I'm not able to be on site as much as I used to be to get those kinds of insights. You know, for the most part, I try and get a little uncomfortable at least once a week, mm -hmm. learn something new and and put myself out there or or just kind of, you know, go down the rabbit hole. And then what would you say are the top three skills you use on a daily basis? Well, despite um, what you're witnessing here, I'm a pretty good listener. 
Um, and that's really important to be able to pick up on cues from people and, and get what they want. Um, I think uh, research is one of those things as well. It's one of my superpowers. Um, I joke that if the recruiting business ever goes belly up, um, maybe I'll become a private investigator because I just <laughs> love finding stuff out and finding people and I probably have to change my name and my identity and not work from home and for the safety <laughs> of my children. Um, and, and then the third, I think is just follow through. You know, it's really important to, when you say you're going to do something for someone to actually do it and follow through. And so in my job, I'll place somebody, but I don't, I don't stop there. I check in with the client to make sure that they're happy with the candidate. I check in with the candidate to make sure they're happy with the client. And it's not a numbers game. I really genuinely care about this team and how this team is constructed. But yeah, I think those are the three. And then what role does mentorship and networking play in your professional growth? A lot, a huge role. Uh, for me personally, and also for the people that come to me for sort of during COVID, I guess my LinkedIn profile looks really approachable. And a lot of people reach out to me saying, how do I X, Y, Z? What, what advice would you give me for blah, blah, blah. And I try to take those calls whenever I can, um, because I was lucky enough to have a lot of very generous people who took those calls from me when I was younger um, I, networking is currency. Your people are your currency and it's important to not go to them, your business network just for stuff, but also to check in. Mm -hmm. Don't just check in with people when you want something, check in with them because it's Sunday or it's their birthday or you, you know, you were someplace and you thought about them. It's really important to cultivate your network with regard to mentorship. Um, I'm always happy to be a resource if somebody has questions and I'm lucky enough that the ladies I work with are incredibly generous and provide their insights. We all work in different verticals on visual effects. We've got some people who do entertainment advertising. We've got people who do like strategic planning and data analysis inside the studio. So it's uh, wonderful that way, but I'm also looking for a younger person to mentor me because I really want to understand the, you know, you hear, oh, millennials this and Gen X that and Gen Z this or whatever. And I, th I would love to, I'm really curious if I ever had a lot of time and a lot of money, I'd probably go back to school to study cultural anthropology so I could understand why people do what they do, what motivates them. Is it nature? Is it nurture? Is it geography? Is it astrology? Is it, you know, I don't know, whatever it is. I'm, I'm super interested in that. So um, I feel like mentoring is something it's, I always felt like the perfect job is one where you're learning something new mm. pretty consistently. You have a mentor and you have an opportunity to mentor somebody else. That's like, I don't care what it is. You could be a cashier. Is If you have those three things, it's the perfect job. Mm. Cashiers are important, by the way. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> What would you say would be, is the most uh, thrilling moment in your career? I th I'd say it was when I was nominated for and, and accepted and received the Visual Effects Society Founders Award in 2019. Uh, it surprised the heck out of me. Um, I had just been sort of quietly keeping my head down and doing what I do, volunteering. And I it, it just, it felt really... Um, incredibly special to be acknowledged for that. Uh, I had to get up, get up and give a, a big speech. Um, I got my hair done. I got my makeup done. I have a beautiful award that sits in my kitchen window and casts rainbows on a sunny day. Oh, nice. And then what's next for you? Here at BLT Recruiting, which stands for Bacon, Le Bacon Lettuce, and Tomato, um, we are looking at ways to expand our capabilities into beyond talent acquisition and into employee retention, mm. um, HR services and, con you know, sort of fractional consulting for people to go into studios and, and do that thing that I was just telling you about where you, how many Laverne's, how many Shirley's, mm. 
but also help with you know onboarding and setting zero, 30, 60, 90 day milestones and making sure that an employer is communicating adequ adequately with their employees and that the employee experience is will inspire loyalty. Mm -hmm. And you've learned quite a lot over the years, very helpful tips. Um, and I would love to pick your brain as to those helpful tips that you've learned along the way, including one minute feedback. I'd love for you to explain that a little bit further. Yeah, so when I was an operations manager at Digital Domain, um, my boss, who was graduated from Yale, um, saw that I had the word manager in my name and felt like I needed a little bit of coaching. So he gave me this book called The One Minute Manager. And I haven't looked at it in years. I'm sure it's terribly out of date. But the thing that I pulled away from that was the importance of sharing with the people that, that report to you three things. One minute of a um, one minute praise and appreciation. Mm -hmm. Hey, you're doing a great job at blah, blah, blah. One minute goal setting. This is what I expect out of you. And what they called the one minute reprimand, but I'm like, I can't reprimand people. I can just sort of, I, 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 I yeah, it's, con it's constructive criticism. Um, I noticed you're doing this. We're looking for you to do this. Can you try these things? And if you have to have that conversation twice, then it's, you know, it's something different. So, um, I think that that's good. Uh, and also I think that as a manager, you have to be open to hearing that peer to peer feedback as well as I always, I've only been a couple of places where they had actual real reviews, real structured reviews. One would be peer to peer. One would be manager to employee. The other would be employee to manager and they're all done on paper. It's not in a room. You're not looking at somebody in the eye while you're telling them like, I really hate how you leave the jar off the peanut butter or whatever it is, you know, that, that, that pisses them off. So mm -hmm. pardon my, um, yeah, that, and then, you know, I was thinking about this, this tips and tricks things. So when all the way through high school, I waited tables and waiting, when you rely on tips for your livelihood, you learn really quickly how to read a situation. So you walk up onto a table and you can tell they're in the middle of a breakup. They probably don't want to hear a joke from you. They probably just want their burger. Um, or you can tell by looking at people's body language, how relaxed they are like, oh, these guys want to be entertained. These guys are here. This is dining is an experience for them. They're not just here to get some food and leave. So you, you learn to pick up those subtle cues, which helps in a suite when you're a producer. Mm -hmm. You also learn that um, ketchup goes with French fries. Uh, Mr. McGillicuddy likes the pink sugar in his coffee. Um, you know, Mrs. Smith, um, likes her tuna on rye. Uh, if you've got a regular customer who comes in and he wants apple pie, you learn to break bad news in a positive way. When you rely on that man's tips, you don't go up and say, Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, we're out of apple pie. You say, Hey, great news. We've got cherry pie and it's hot out of the oven. And so you, you just, you, you know, are constantly learning how to put sort of a positive spin on things. So for a while, when I was working at, um, uh, as a head of production, I would only hire people who worked in food service because I feel like they understand people. And that is just as important as understanding the process, I think, if not more so, because the people are going to stick around and the process is going to change. When I became sort of an impromptu career coach during COVID, I came up with a formula. I'm sure I, it's not original. But it was, if you, Christina, are looking to make a change in your career, I want you to think about three things. Not you, Christina, but I'm just using you as an example. Sure. So one of them is, what do you want to do? And maybe that's three different things. Maybe you've always had a secret yearning to be a trapeze artist or something. Um, the second is, what can you do? What skills do you possess that you can back into what you want to do? And then the third is the biggest one. What are you willing to do? Are you willing to relocate? Do you need to go back to school and get another um, certificate? Uh, are you willing to, if you're changing careers altogether, are you willing to take a step backwards in salary, backwards in title? 
that's the, that's the tricky thing. And that's not something that anybody can answer off the cuff. Um, one of the things I'm often asked is, well, how do I find the opportunities? So if you know, you want to be, um, I don't know, a, a project manager in animation at Netflix, go on to LinkedIn and look at the titles of, look at the people who have the titles project manager and animation at Netflix. You'll notice some similarities. Ah, oh, Netflix likes to pull from Warner Brothers Animation. And um, this person also worked at, um, at Bento Box and Stupid Buddy. Huh, maybe there's some opportunities at these other companies. So if you reverse engineer someone's trajectory, you learn two things. One is your dream company, where they prefer to get people from. And two is opportunities for you along the way to hone your skills so that you can eventually get there. Um, and then, uh, in terms of other tips and tricks, um, I think that, um, you know, we, we had a conversation about being organized, uh, earlier and I, there was this lovely woman at digital domain in the nineties. I'll never forget this kindness. I decided when I was an administrative assistant that I eventually wanted to work in production. And so I asked this producer if I could take her to lunch and pick her brain about what it means to be a producer. And we went to this very fancy place near digital domain called Chaya that was way out of my budget. And I, and I scrimped and I saved and I pulled together all my money because I wanted to take her to lunch. Had my notebook, had my pen, and proceeded to ask her a series of questions. And she was incredibly generous with her time and her insights. Her takeaway was, if you want to be in production, you have to make sure that you you have a supportive environment for the artists so they can concentrate on what they do whether that means if someone's pulled an all-nighter getting them a cab if um do they have an ergonomic chair do they have the software they need do they need a telephone are they getting the right communications do they have enough to eat and then in terms of keeping yourself organized she suggested that you touch this is back in the days of three ring binders and paper um that you touch everything only once and read it, know where, put it away and know where you found it. And those are two big takeaways for me for how to be a successful producer, but I'm a slob. I did not do the second one. <laughs> I will say <laughs> it's great advice. Somebody will take it. I'm sure. Yes, for sure. I'm sorry. I actually had one more. Oh yeah. Go for okay, it. Okay. So this one is, this one's my favorite. It's stupid, but I love it. So don't be afraid. If you're a new person at a studio, do not be afraid to ask stupid questions. To illustrate the importance of this, I'm going to share with you a story about a woman who is teaching her daughter how to make a ham. So she said, okay, you get your ham out, you bring it up to room temperature, you get your brown sugar, you get your cloves, set your oven to 250, low and slow, grease your pan, and then you take your ham and you cut off a piece about this big and you wrap it in aluminum foil and you stick it in the freezer. And then you, and the daughter's like, wait, <laughs> why? And the mom's like, why what? She's like, why do you? She's like, I don't know. That's how my mom taught me. So they call grandma and grandma listens and she says, huh, that's how my mom taught me. Well, luckily great grandma's still alive. So they give her a call and she listens to the story. And at the end of it, she sighs. <sighs> the reason you cut off that piece of ham and put it away for later is because when I taught you, the pan was too small. <laughs> that is perfect. Ask perfect. stupid questions. Yes. Ask especially the way. About, especially about process and yeah. it, especially when there's waste involved, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Everything's evolving so quickly that the processes sometimes are, are dated um, and we don't realize it. And it just takes someone else coming in who's not involved in the day to day all the time. You just question it. For sure. Um, and we believe in a uh, making a ripple of change. So with that in mind, who would you like to see on the next podcast? Well, there are three people um, who were pretty important to me in my early career. Um, one of them is Amy Jupiter, whom I've mentioned, who is incredibly generous and, and uh, always gave me just enough rope and allowed me to screw up, which was terrific. 
Um, the other one was Victoria Alonso, with whom I worked in the uh, early aughts at a company called A52. I was her coordinator. Mm-hmm. Um, she uh, taught me the importance of accountability and just being buttoned up. And she was great with clients. I learned a lot from her watching. And also I learned from her, she always had a side project going on. She was always helping somebody with a short film on the outside and looking for um, volunteers to come in and help her. And she was always doing something else. That creativity didn't end in the suite. Mm -hmm. It was also outside the room. And then um, Brooke Breton, who is was the first executive producer at Digital Domain. And I think currently she works as a consultant. And she's just somebody who early on I saw her navigate um, motherhood and entertainment and, and all of that stuff. And now she's doing some amazing things for the Visual Effects Society, helping to build a museum, uh, like a virtual museum. And um, she's just... Uh, very genuine, approachable, kind person. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Susan. I appreciate it. It was lovely to hear your story and also all of the wonderful career advice that you were able to share with us.